And they came to him and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Summer of 2004, I think it was, I was a camp counselor at a Lutheran Bible camp in Idaho. And one week I had in my group this kid whose name is lost to the sands of time. We'll just call him Danny. Danny was going into fifth grade and he had never been away from home overnight, which kind of flabbergasted me, especially since here he is at this week-long sleepaway Bible camp, (laughs) baptism by fire. And this poor kid was beside himself with homesickness. He would just start crying at the drop of a hat, pleading with me to call his parents and have them come and pick him up and take him home. So drop off for camp was on Sunday. I don't remember how we made it through Sunday afternoon, but somehow we did. (laughs) Monday was not much better. By Tuesday, he was participating a little bit more with the rest of the group, but still, he just all of a sudden the drop of a hat started bawling and begging to go home. I tried listening to his fears. I tried being hopeful and getting him to think about all the fun stuff he was going to do this week. I tried redirecting him to things that he enjoyed. And for a while it would work. He'd be having great fun. You know, he'd forget about what was going on and be having fun with his new friends. And then all of a sudden, he'd just start crying again. I'd say, look, you're having fun. And he'd say, I just want to go home. By Wednesday, I was out of ideas. By Wednesday, when he got sad, I got angry. Angry. I actually yelled at this poor kid. I yelled at him for being homesick. (laughs) Looking back now, I can see that I wasn't really angry at him. I was angry at myself. I was angry at myself because I couldn't fix what was wrong for this kid. I said all the right things, I'd taken the correct steps, but I couldn't make him stop being homesick. And that made me angry. How silly is that? To be angry at a child for missing missing his parents. But in that moment, when I lacked control over the situation that I believed it was my job to control, I was angry. Probably because I was scared because I didn't know what to do next. We don't like it when we don't know what to do next, do we? That's what I see in the story of Holy Week. I see a bunch of people who believe it is their job to be in control. Camp counselors for an entire nation, you might say. And when they lose control, they get angry, probably because they're scared. You can see it in how they react. They don't just kill Jesus, they seal him in a tomb and they set guards to watch over it. They set guards on a corpse. They're trying to regain control. It made sense in the moment, but looking back, it's as absurd as yelling at a homesick child. But by contrast, notice what God does in the story. Instead of trying to control the situation... Jesus always chooses to act in love. Even when doing that means giving up control of his own situation. It seems like the people in power are the ones setting the course of events. But today we find out that God still owns the story even though God isn't pulling any of the strings. Anger Fear, violence, force, compulsion. These are the tools that we use in the story, and they all fail to stand up to that calm, patient love that God continually shows throughout. That's the love that walks out of the tomb. St. Matthew uses this dramatic scene of the earth shaking and the stone rolling away and the living guards dropping like stones to paint that picture for us. All of the power 
that we can wield, every power that we have at our disposal falls short when faced with the power of heaven, the power of love. Because when you come right down to it, one cannot simply order a child not to be homesick, right? It's obvious to me now what I should have done back in 04. I should have, I know now that there's no way to take away what Danny was feeling. But I could have loved him through it. He was fine by the end of the week, of course. He had a blast Thursday and Friday and was excited to come back next summer. Go figure. <laughs> if I had trusted that that's what would happen, or that it wouldn't and things would still work out in the end, if I could have given up my need to be in control of that situation and make him have fun, maybe I could have figured out what he really needed in that moment, given it to him. It was probably someone to listen to him and help him feel safe and secure, right? Julian of Norwich, when she was a young woman, had a near-death experience during which she received several visions. Later in life, she recounted those visions and what she learned from them. And in one vision, she observed that everything that exists, quote, lasts and always will because God loves it. Everything has being through the love of God. God made it. God loves it. God preserves it, she writes. In other words, it is only by the continual and patient love of God poured out that everything in existence continues to be. That's what Easter is. It's a reminder of God's infinite love poured out for us infinitely, sustaining us through this and that and the next to the end and even beyond. It is that love that creates us, that love that sustains us, something that we are powerless to do by ourselves. It is that love that renews us and helps us to grow, and it is that love that at our life's end gives us hope that life is made new in ways previously unimagined, like a square cut up with holes poked in it that becomes a fountain. I have no words for this love, and so instead I'd like to invite you to try something with me. I'd like to invite you into a moment of contemplation of this love. So I'll ask you to sit up straight, feet flat on the floor, if you're able, hold your hands in your lap. You want to be relaxed and comfortable, but alert. Next, seated. We bow. Shunryu Suzuki says that when we bow, we give ourselves up. We relinquish control. Before we can meet the risen Christ, we first have to let go of the notion that we're in control. So instead, we set our minds on thing of things above, as Paul says. Suzuki says that if we ever get to a place in life where all you can do is bow, you should do it. So right now, we bow... We give ourselves up in communal gratitude for the miracle of being here, being alive together in this moment. Sitting still, straight, with our eyes closed or lowered to the ground, we begin by simply becoming aware of our breathing. Breathe in, breathe out, slow, deep, natural breaths. <clears throat> now with each inhalation, listen with a childlike sincerity to God's silent, I love you. God giving God's self away to us whole and complete in each breath, sustaining us every moment in love, just like Julian saw. 
Each breath in is the infinity of God pouring itself out for us infinitely in the self-donating gift of this inhalation. Then with each exhalation, let go of yourself. Exhale yourself in love, a self-donating act, giving back the gift that God has given. With each exhalation, give yourself to this infinite love that with the next inhalation is infinitely giving itself back to you. In the reciprocity of love, our destiny, creation's destiny, is fulfilled. Inhaling, exhaling, breathing this love. Become aware of what arises in you. The thoughts, the feelings that cross your mind. Maybe it's something troubling and burdensome, either in your own life or in the life of someone you love. Maybe it's a source of fear, a source of confusion, a source of abandonment, something that's burdensome to your heart an obstacle to you loving yourself or someone else or God. As you inhale, inhale God's self-donating love, loving you through and through and through and through, burden and all, finding no more hindrance to being infinitely in love with you than the stone and the guards at Jesus' tomb. And with each exhalation, exhale yourself, giving yourself in love, burden and all, to the love loving you, burden and all, sustaining you in your being unexplainably forever. We end by asking God for the grace of returning to this place of love over and over and over again until little by little 
it begins to saturate everything else in your life. You start to see everything else floating in this tide of love being poured in, poured out endlessly.